Uh, hello, friends. Welcome to the Berry Center. We are an agricultural nonprofit uh, based here in beautiful Henry County, Kentucky. We are putting Wendell Berry's writings to work, advocating for farmers, land conserving communities, and healthy regional economies. My name is Ben Aguilar. I'm the director of operations here at the center. Uh, and what you are watching now is a little bit of an experiment for us. This isn't quite one of our agrarian voices lectures. This isn't quite a, an author event. Um, this is more sort of a loosely structured interview around a topic that is of great interest to us and we think will be of great interest to you. Um, our guest today, uh, Indra Shekhar Singh, is an independent writer, agricultural policy analyst, and former director for policy and outreach for the National Seed Association of India. Uh, he's been published extensively in the agricultural press in India and here in the States, and hosts the Farm Talks podcast uh, for The Wire. Um, which is a really uh, incredible Indian agricultural publication. You can also find his, uh, excuse me, his regular column there as well. Um, along with all this, he's currently uh, researching uh, the history of parity agriculture, which is something that we'll be talking about later on here in the United States. And that is, of course, how we made our acquaintance with him uh, here at the archive of the Berry Center. Um, uh, we've been uh, trying to schedule <laughs> this conversation for some time now. Uh, it turns out couldn't have happened at a better time. Uh, this turns out to be a very lively conversation, a very timely conversation, excuse me. Um, but friends, please help me welcome Indra Shekhar Singh. Indra, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Well, we're, we're awfully pleased. Um, like I was saying, you know, this has turned out to be such a timely uh, conversation. You and I have been sort of in contact for about a year now. Um, uh, sharp-eyed viewers of the, or sharp-eyed readers of the Berry Center's publications will know, um, I uh, published a piece in one of our newsletters in 2020 about the ongoing uh, farmer-led protests in India. Um, those sort of resolved in kind of resolved after about two years. Um, and we saw this sort of period of uh, maybe less antagonism between Indian farmers and the Indian government. But I mean, literally as of yesterday, after we scheduled this call, um, we have seen a real uptick in tension, in violence, in um, again, that antagonism between the Indian government and the farm population. Uh, in India, and I wonder if you could just start off by telling us what is the situation, what is uh, what is happening, what has caused this new outbreak of protest, um, and uh, why do you think it is that the the government response to this has been so, um, I would say, outsized? See, Ben. So first of all, what is happening right now is a, is is a big blot on the conscience of India, mm -hmm. where peacefully marching farmers, and I'm not just saying 10 or 15, mm -hmm. thousands of tractors that have left the country, they've, they've left their villages, they've left their farms, and they were doing a tractor gate, a peaceful tractor gate, keep in mind, they had already talked to the government, said that we want to come into Delhi on the 13th of February. And why we want to do this is because Indian farmers deserve a life of dignity and agroeconomic justice. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? that the state of Indian agriculture and the agriculturalist is so, is so poor that the person cannot even buy a table fan from the profits of one month. Imagine you work hard in your, in your field and you can't even buy one table fan a month. Mm -hmm. that's they have some people earn less than $48 in profit in the entire year. Mm -hmm. That's how bad things are. You know, these farmers are very small holding farmers. Of our, and we are very much like what U.S. was in the 1920s and between the 1920s and 1950s. There, was, there are still very many family farms. Of course, the size is completely different. When I say small farm, I mean one, two, three, four, five acre farms mm -hmm. where a family of five or six are surviving. Mm -hmm. And in the U.S., there were family farms, which were, again, family members working on the farm and larger land holdings. Mm -hmm. But you could imagine that the structure, the principle behind the organization of the farm, which was the family, still mm -hmm. is alive in India. You know, the land ethic is still alive in India. Mm -hmm. And what these farmers got out to do in the tractor trade was to tell the government that, listen, we need price floors as a, a legal guarantee, a legal right for us. Mm -hmm. Because when the daily wage laborer or the construction worker or any person working in the economy has a minimum wage, has a minimum daily wage and has a minimum hourly wage, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So why shouldn't the, the the daily wage or the right price, the fair price for farmers be built in the cost of produced when they sell it in the market? So, mm-hmm. so th- what they are saying in India, we have something called the minimum support price, mm-hmm. which was given to the Indian administration by a U.S. gentleman called Dr. Frank Parker in the 1950s, mm-hmm. who suggested the idea, taking from the parity years, taking from you know the, the great years of American agriculture between 1942 and, and 1953, you know those years. It it they said that well, India can have a similar system so mm-hmm. that the farmers don't suffer. Mm-hmm. Now the Indian farmers even now are just demanding that. Now, again, I have to put a little bit more context to this, that the main main movement and the main convoy started in the northwestern state of Punjab, which is, which is the major hub for agro-political resistance. And these farmers started the convoy only because of one reason, because the government did not fulfill its promises. Back in 2022, January, the Indian, the farmers left their camps on the promise that the government will have some kind of guarantee for ensuring minimum support price for farmers. Mm -hmm. They wanted that the price floor mechanism, which was also there in the US, becomes a system for every farmer available in the country. Mm -hmm. The government said we're going to do that, but they never did. In fact, the government after January 2020, and and keep in mind, this is is, uh, February 2020, sorry, 2024, and Mm -hmm. the government just stopped talking with them. For two years, after promising them that they are going to be talking with them, they're going to withdraw the cases against the farmers, they're going to provide compensation for the people who lost their lives during the movement, the government did nothing. And again, as 2024 is an election year in the United States and also in India, so the government, so the people said, if now, otherwise never. This government will never listen. So they started the track trade after telling the government, doing all, following all proper procedures, Mm -hmm. But the government responded with heavy police violence, heavy paramilitary violence. Today, the Punjab-Haryana border, which are the two states next to Delhi, Mm -hmm. they resemble the India-Pakistan border, if not worse. The Mm -hmm. Indian-Pakistan border have more civility, whereas the borders between interstate borders between Punjab and Haryana look like a war zone, where advanced weaponries are coming and dropping tear gas bombs. There are pellet guns that are blinding farmers. Over 100 people have been injured. We don't know the the internet's blocked down. We don't know how many people have died. Mm -hmm. So all this is happening just because farmers said, we want a fair price for our produce. Mm -hmm. And this is just the trigger event. I'll go into the the background later, but this is to answer your question of what's happening right now. Things Mm -hmm. are not looking right. They've called for a national general strike. So today, 16th of February, will be a national general strike organized by the farmers Mm -hmm. to tell the government that, listen, we are not going to have it your way. We're going to be peaceful, but we are not going to take injustice. Absolutely. Um, I'd, yeah, I'd like to, uh, for our uh, listeners here in the States, I mean, I, I don't know that many of us have an idea of the scale even of those original protests, 2020, 2021, um, and the the sort of violent response against them. I mean, to my understanding, uh, and this is just in terms of numbers that we've been able to, to, to find here, I mean, almost a thousand people were killed in these clashes between, uh, you know, a, a peaceful farm protest and, uh, you know, uh, the, essentially the government police response to it. Um, I, I think that there's uh, been a lot of news lately about farm protests um, kind of all over the world. And I'd like to talk about those later too. But what we usually see out of those is, you know, uh, a bunch of <laughs> a bunch of, you know, tractors spraying manure on government buildings and uh, shutting down highways and things like that. What we don't see a lot of is the police response to it. And in India in particular, um, because the type of farmer that we're dealing with here is uh, much more of like the classic idea, the, the American idea of the smallholder. Um, I wonder if, you know, the government feels more empowered to respond with violence than we see in a lot of these, you know, Western European countries, or maybe the media presence is a little bit higher, the um, general interest uh, in labor action is a little bit higher. Um, do, could you maybe talk a little bit about the first wave of protests? I know you were on the ground, you know, uh, embedded with with a lot of these, that first round. What was it that caused this um, this series of protests to kick off in 2020 in particular. I know that this time, you know, the the word is essentially that the government hasn't followed through on promises made after this first round. 
What was it that caused the first round of protests specifically? I know there were some bills passed, um, some kind of major changes to the Indian agricultural economy from a policy standpoint. Um, can you talk, uh, kind of talk our audience through what those things were um, that started these protests in 2020? Absolutely. See, what happened is that when the world was raging because of Corona, you know, people were locked down, shut down, governments had dictatorial powers, they could do anything they wanted to. So what, what happened in the meanwhile is that the Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, and just to give the audience a little bit of uh, con context, India, does, India has a Westminster style parliamentary democracy, mm -hmm. which means that we have two houses, a lower house and an upper house. And the prime minister is responsible, is, is part of the lower house and cannot pass any law without the approval of the parliament. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep that is a very clear distinction that will come handy later. It's not like the American presidential system where the president can pass an executive order and then that has to be ratified by the Senate. Here, the Senate ratifies first and then the law is passed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now keep that in mind, that structure in mind. But during the coronavirus lockdowns, the state had emergency powers, which meant that the prime minister himself could pass laws without the approval of the parliament. And in the height of all of this, one day prime minister comes on television and tells the country that India is opening up for business and Indian agriculture, which is protected, the Indian farmer, which is protected, the Indian uh, marketing system, which was, which was protected. Today is going to be opened for Cargill, it's going to be opened for Walmart, it's going to be opened for agri-dollar farming. From mm -hmm. a food farming nation, we are going to become an agri-dollar farming nation. And what this means is that we are not going to grow food that we eat ourselves, but we are going to grow food that we can sell to the market, that we can sell to Cargill, that we can sell to, to Walmart and other places. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you what this and how did this happen. See, India has been, India was colonized by the East India Company and later the British Crown. And there were, agriculture was the principal instrument of exploitation during those time periods. We were forced to cultivate opium, forced to cultivate cotton, forced to cultivate indigo. And Gandhi, who's a major figure of the world, actually started his first movement in India against the forced cultivation of indigo in the state of Bihar. Mm. So agriculture has always been a very, very touchy subject because India has 16, 16 agroclimatic zones. A lot of uh, people who can, who can convert this land into a paradise. So the, when the East India Company came, it utilized the villages, it utilized the people for its own selfish private goals. And it took the opium from India, sold it to, uh, sold it to China. American privateers were involved, starting the you know, people who founded Yale and other, other, other prestigious American <laughs> colleges. They were part of the opium deal and, and trading and, and killing and the killing and the exploitation of Indians and also the Chinese. That's where most of the wealth comes from. Yeah. But this is just to give you a historical background. So mm -hmm. when India becomes independent, we say we are not going to allow another East India company into our agriculture. We are not going to our farmers because they have been so, much, so depressed and so destroyed because of you know the war effort, also the Allied war effort, Winston Churchill personally is responsible for starving at least four million Indians, mm -hmm. causing the, one of the biggest uh, famines of the world, the Bengal famine. Okay, in a period of two years. So by the time the British left India in 1947, Indian food economy was destroyed, decimated. Indian agricultural resilience was destroyed. So we said we cannot allow another company into agriculture, and hence there should be protections. Mm -hmm. The first protection was that no one in no one in India can individually own more than 18 acres of irrigated land or the value equivalent of 18 acres of, of, of uh, irrigated fertile land. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind, we are also socialists, not in the communist sense, but we are middle of capitalism and, and communism, mm -hmm. socialism, which is taking care of the poor, but also not banning industry and, and private enterprise. Certainly. So we yeah. said people can own 18 acres, but... There will be, but the company cannot come directly and have corporate contracts with the farmers. Why? Mm -hmm. Because India has already been dropped off because of corporate contracts in the, in the past. We mm -hmm. don't want to do that in the future. Then the second thing that we got in India was that in case, you know, the farmer, when he goes to the market, market yard to sell, mm -hmm. he, there are chances that he can be cheated because he's one acre farmer. He's going up against the trader who's buying maybe the entire village's mm -hmm. produce. 
Mm-hmm. So there is a there is an upper hand. So we said we are going to have market yards, government regulated market yards, mm-hmm. where people can come and sell their produce at the government regulated rate, so that mm-hmm. the farmer is not cheated, the company who's buying is not cheated, and the middleman also gets doesn't make excessive profits. Mm-hmm. That's a very very important distinction that India instituted government market yards to ensure that the trade happens in a fair way, mm-hmm. and you know the greed doesn't win always. The last thing that we did. which is again very very critical for the not just the food security but also the life security of our nation is we said food is not going to be considered as a classic commodity now again what do i mean by classic commodity that can be traded without limits that can be moved without restrictions so they said food is going to be a special kind of commodity which will have certain rules associated with it which mm-hmm. means that no one can hold no agri processor no cargill no walmart no nobody can hold more than or 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 stockpile more than a certain limit of certain grains what mm-hmm. do i mean by that that if if ben if you had a silo in india your silo can only hold for example 20 tons i'm taking a figurative example oh, sure. and beyond that if you you you're not allowed to hold it because once you have a larger kind of concentration of food you can dictate prices this is exactly what cargill did to american farmers back in the days they controlled the massive supply of the of the of the bar- barrages of the the silos of the green elevators and they managed to uh, destroy the farmers mm-hmm. so the indians learned from this experience and said we are not going to have this keep in mind three things we have three protections land sealing we have uh, we have government market yards we have no company contracts and we have an essential commodities act which restricts people from hoarding and stockpiling unlimited amount of food mm-hmm. okay this has been the largest structure then comes the green revolution where the us us the usda has actually influenced a lot of in the starting of the indian policies and many people do not know this piece but much of indian agricultural systems the modern industrial agricultural systems that india adopted after the green revolution were actually funded for and advised for by the usda so it's your tax paying dollars that helped our country form this this baseline of industrial agricultural uh, foundations mm-hmm. okay including the chemical manufacturing union carbide factories oh, and, and other things so it was basically mm-hmm. american capital that was leading this effort okay so things are going as fine people are producing green revolution already has had 50 years in india and suddenly there is this big crash the crash is that because of the green revolution's technology it has a redundancy built in it which basically means that after using chemicals for maybe 50 years on your land the 60th year your land will not be the same mm-hmm. either you would need a high input uh, return or your land will simply be desolate and where a society that's eating off that land will get food style diseases like cancer diabetes like and 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 a whole plethora of other other problems which which today the indian state of punjab is suffering there are cancer trains that go from punjab to cancer hospitals in rajasthan because the 50 year green revolution chemical project is now coming to you know the crash so keep in all this mind keep and i'm giving you just context here so the indian prime minister in the context of all of this says that we are going to now allow open up india for companies and allow for comp- corporate corporate farming second he says food is not just food is just another commodity so we are going to allow unlimited stockpiling now cargill can come and buy all the grain that india has to produce and that's legal now okay and the third thing that he said uh sorry we have the corporate contract we are going to have not just market yards private market yards but we are going to have tax free par- private market yards so here he's creating a, a dichotomy whereas there are these government taxed market yards mm-hmm. where farmers can come and sell their produce and the tax that is being collected here is used to improve rural infrastructure like roads and other facilities yeah. whereas these corporate market yards first of all will be corporatized and will not have any tax on it so mm-hmm. naturally he's tilting the balance towards the corporate market yards mm-hmm. and these were the three big rules that he announced and then got in a very undemocratic way through a voice vote passed in the parliament mm-hmm. it is again a very shady political wheeling dealing because of which the this uh, these bills were passed and once these bills were passed the farmers knew that now our price floors which, which exist right now in states like punjab and haryana are going to be taken away from us mm-hmm. you know indian in india has 6% of its farmers that are paid the price floor amounts okay mm-hmm. which is the msp or the pri- or the parity price mm-hmm. now the farmers who are receiving this money said that well this is going to be disastrous we need to start walking 
and they and they and this is about i think in, overall in the movement from the people who donated to the people who lived in the camps about 25 million people were directly engaged in the movement that lasted for 13 months yeah. from from june from june of 2020 up till december of 2020 uh, 2021 Yeah. And I think it's that, it's important to stop on that number real quick. What we're talking about here is as far as I know, the largest labor action in the history of the world, in the history of humanity. I mean, the most people involved. Um and that it was in defense of an agricultural system. Uh I mean, it makes total sense in that obviously we're all tied to the agricultural system every single day for what we're eating but also that india as a country and the shape of the indian agricultural economy is such that it allowed that i mean the the idea of 25 million americans coming out to protest over you know poor prices at the farm gate is insane to us i mean and we're seeing you know we are seeing um in certain sectors you know people are making less money than they ever have here uh but the idea of 25 million people coming out and i understand that the population is different between the countries but cut it in half 12 million 10 million the idea of 10 million people coming out to do anything in the united states is is um it is really kind of mind boggling and that was the first thing that caught my eye when i when i saw the scale of um the protest so anyway to get back with, to what you're saying these three acts were passed on a voice vote very undemocratically um and certainly against the wishes of the people um if you could pick back up there and maybe just tell us uh you know we're used to dealing in the United States with uh an economy wherein about 1% of us maybe even a little less than 1% of us are actively engaged in agriculture um be that farming processing um distribution you know you may creep up above that 1 2% number if you start including logistics and things like that but um really we've we've consolidated our farm economy to the degree that very few humans are involved in it um india is a totally different story uh could you could you speak to that a little bit maybe as we talk about sort of what happened next and this this huge outpouring of support yeah so let me just blow you with another stat about mm-hmm. 600 million people in india Mm-hmm. are directly involved with agriculture. Yeah. India has a population of 1.5 billion mm-hmm. and 600 million are in agriculture. So you can imagine that uh, about give or give or take of 50 to 60% of our population mm-hmm. is directly depending on agriculture not just as an occupation but mm-hmm. as a means of livelihood and um, and the way they live life. Yeah. So it's not just an occupation it's not just oh this is something I have to do. This is my life. this is not agriculture this is my life you know that distinction is very important mm-hmm. and i believe in, in even in the writings of mr berry and and earlier writings america was also like this at a certain point ago like maybe 100 years ago america was 100 like years this. ago yeah about 100 and that's why i said the period between in the 1920s and 1950s when when the first decay started to really happen america was this country also and i'm not talking in terms of whether we were the same people we did the same farming no mm-hmm. the principle that guided us in our lives was the same and that's why i keep going back to it and the economic conditions even if you have an equivalence i believe that the period between you know uh, the 100 years ago in america and in in, in india right now we can find similarities not mm-hmm. the same Absolutely. but we will find many similarities mm-hmm. okay and and another thing is that see because of the chemical farming and other things agricultural production has increased like there's overproduction like it happened after the end of the world war 2 in america prices mm-hmm. fell like yeah. like a, like what happened in after the great, great depression indian farmers have been experiencing a great depression year after year and corona was like the really the rock bottom you mm-hmm. see so so all of this combined like in india agriculture is very alive the culture is alive it's something what mr wood berry talks about in the unsettling of america you know the land ethic is not dead yet mm-hmm. if you if you sell your land it's it's considered like dishonoring your own mother you, mm-hmm. you see so those kind of things still exist and and within the context of all of this these people watch uh, walk to the uh, walk to the delhi's borders they blockaded three major arterial highways mm-hmm. that were getting out of the city for 13 months against you know during the time corona was ravaging the world against ak47 against like thousands of paramilitary forces surveillance drones people in, in infiltrating the camps people provocateurs you know there you know there were women there for the first time you know women had come out in huge numbers 
supporting their husbands supporting their brothers siblings children and fighting and taking the police batons on them on themselves so this was the not just a farmers movement but during the 13 months it became a larger social coalition to fight against injustice in society it was a melting pot where people from all over the country came together you know interacted with different cultures it's like an i person from iowa meeting a person from new mexico mm-hmm. you see for the first time in their lives they are both farmers they've never stepped out of their block their region but mm-hmm. for the first time they can actually sit next to each other and talk about corn or talk yeah. about hey you know what i grow this i do this do that mm-hmm. and this is happening for 13 months so this is really the rock uh, you know this is really the forge in which agro pol- political resistance is is built and dreamed of is dreamt of okay that is what this movement was and i'm going to only do i'm going to like just do nutshell understanding of it because it's a 13 months cannot be explained in one hour oh yeah but some some of but some of the other salient features that were there were that overnight these people constructed thir- like maybe 20 mile long cities mm-hmm. made of made of just nothing like wood and plastic yeah their the their, their encampments were 15 miles long 20 miles long and all throughout the encampment you could find free food free water a place to sleep a place a blanket in the in the cold anybody who came to the camps was given free food that's part of the gift economy that these farmers carried with them they mm-hmm. said we are farmers we don't know how to fight we know how to feed mm-hmm. so we will feed everybody even the people who beat us they can come to us and we will offer them a hot meal and mm-hmm. that's what they did for 13 months so that is the kind of integrity they had you know it's it, having and and everything you say well who is sort of funding it that's a big question you know the, the real political people among us will ask hey was this who's who's behind this mm-hmm. so the answer to that is that farmers this was a completely farmer led movement mm-hmm. because there are farmers and farms everywhere in india as soon as the city limits finish the farms begin mm-hmm. so around and in and around their camps there were these massive supply lines where if a farmer was was had excess milk if they had vegetables they would not go to the market but send it to the camps so every day local farmers would drive in their tractors with their trolleys behind them and mm-hmm. offer whatever they had to these camps people poured in all the supplies people had like people who had bottling plants gave bottling water bottled water people had so it was a whole big social movement which actually represented what change should look like instead of like a money based transactional economy we should have a heart and a gift economy and this was the real incarnation and manifestation of that and yeah. that is the only reason why it won mm-hmm. if the movement was real political was it thinking like had machiavellian thoughts or mm-hmm. had machiavellian designs it would have failed because the farmers leaders you know there was much police brutality on them also but mm-hmm. they never stopped going around the country and talking about this magical formula called msp which basically is nothing but the parity program in the us with a different name in india which yeah. actually is saying that we need price floors now if we have to save agriculture otherwise india will also be farming without farmers mm-hmm. and that was you know some of the key features the, the farmer leaders traveled all across the country built a national campaign and when seeing that the government realized that we cannot take this anymore we have to send the farmers back they lied to the farmers they they rescinded the three laws which mm-hmm. i already explained earlier about the essential commodities and about com- contract farming and about private market yards mm-hmm. and they said that we will think about your price floors and your msp idea mm-hmm. now this is where the government betrayed the farmers and this begins the second story second part of the story see january when they went back and they came back to talk with the government in good faith mm-hmm. the government said well you have no leverage now so go back to your home we are not talking to you and we are going to make a silly committee which is going to deliberate on the ms on the parity price floor idea mm-hmm. and instead of having farmers be part of that committee they had very pro corporate uh, lobbyist who were part of that committee so the farmers boycotted it they mm-hmm. said we are not going to be part of this committee this committee is not in our favor and what resulted in in the next two years which is coming to now 2024 the farmers said that farmer leader said that we are going to organize our own campaigns across the country get more people in the fold now as these two years happened the government tried to break the farm unions they tried to you know cause splinter groups create confusion among the farmers but the farmer leaders came overcame that mm-hmm. now the story moves to 6 months ago when fresh round of agitation started in the state of punjab and in other parts of the country 
because the because this is an election year people knew that if the government does not listen now the modi government does not listen now it will never listen mm-hmm. so they started mini hunger strikes they started civil disobedience in in small capacities in punjab and other parts of north india and south india and it is only like and then in january there was a big call that now because the government is not listening even to small actions they are not fulfilling their promises we've had two years of just no talk and stalemate now we're going to have another tractor march in delhi so mm-hmm. another splinter group from the larger organization of farmers said we are going to lead this whoever wants to follow us can follow us and that's where we are right now that the first group these four group four four five organizations within the larger body of the farm leadership actually started the march they were stopped in the punjab haryana border and dealt with violently they are still being beaten right now as we speak mm-hmm. and now a larger coalition of of other farmers is also coming on board and maybe there is talk of of once again besieging the city and reminding the government that you have to listen to us to the promises that you made to us about giving dignity and agro economic justice to every farmer that is in this country mm-hmm. you cannot just be pro corporate you cannot just waive corporate loans if you're waiving loans you have to waive farmer debt also because mm-hmm. it's you who got us in this position we were happy doing our indigenous farming we were happy doing our 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 native farming you got us into these chemicals you got us into this debt and by trusting you we are here so it's time that you be the government that you tell you are that that you say you are and actually work with us so that's that's the overall general kind of perspective on on the previous protest and how that links to the one right now mm-hmm. well it's so interesting the uh you know when viewed from afar like i said the scale of it uh particularly this first round and i expect the you know uh, i have every expectation that uh you know maybe their tactics are they think they're doing something different by trying to stop this group but to me it seems like that would just sort of inflame um support for you know what's obviously a peaceful procession into the city and um i won't speculate on what they're thinking there but again just the the idea that if half of your workforce if half of the indian labor force and you know half of the economy is tied up in agricultural production particularly organized organized around a model that has been you know more or less functional for many years outside of climate concerns outside of you know this sort of corporate infringement um it it just doesn't make any sense to me why at least again in an, in an election year you know there wouldn't be at least some negotiating in good faith so uh if we could i i'd like to maybe have you uh, opine a little bit on um because you've studied again the the indian agricultural system and the american agricultural system so extensively something that you said really stuck out to me um a lot of our work here at the center is based around the burley tobacco program um and folks who follow what we do will have kind of a, a general understanding of what that is anyone who's tuning in for the first time uh the the burley tobacco growers cooperative association was kind of the foundation of farm wealth in our region um and that program used a mechanism very much like what you're describing indra where uh you have this sort of uh quasi governmental entity that is providing a price floor for agricultural commodity um in our case burley tobacco but this was you know you mentioned kind of the great depression and uh what we call the new deal around here you know the sort of um this massive expansion of government programs around protecting agriculture that sort of erupted after that uh you know it was burley tobacco here but it was different crops all over the country um and it was a system very much like what you're describing i think there was a real um energy policy energy around the 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 mid century um to protect agriculture in this way but something that you said really stuck out to me uh, you know what you're dealing with in india the scale of production by individuals is so small and the scale of competition from these corporate entities is so large that like there's got to be something in between sort of buffering it and you mentioned specifically the idea that engaging in individual contracts with farmers was more or less outlawed because of that kind of discrepancy in um in scale that people are operating at and the kind of power differential there um 
Can you maybe talk a little bit about the history of, of that, you know, in the starting in the 50s and maybe talk to a little bit about like the actual agricultural landscape that we're talking about here? I know you and I have spoken a lot about like food support programs and how those tie into um, this policy. And that is a real departure from the American system. So if you could talk about maybe the similarities in these commodity programs, but also the discrepancies there between um, food support and how those two tie in so closely in, in India. So Ben, many, many, many of the younger viewers would found, will, will find it quite surprising that everything that I'm talking about has mm -hmm. been inspired by the US. Mm -hmm. The New Deal farm programs was the basis for the agricultural systems that are in India right now. Mm -hmm. You talked about the food program. Well, I'll, I'll start from there, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, the grain reserves was a thing that Henry Wallace brought about in America during the New, New Deal programs. Mm -hmm. America had grain reserves where it took off excessive grain and surplus grain from the market and stored it so mm -hmm. that there's better supply management. Mm -hmm. India also had a similar India also had a similar system when we became independent said that well what we need to connect the farmers to a procurement system and a government should be that buffer exactly like how the tobacco program worked using mm -hmm. a cooperative uh, price floors a, a non recourse loan and and entities and then grain reserves when we talk about other like corn or, or wheat or other grains that that were grown in America so we see that the system is again indian system is just nothing but an american idea that was that is that that is developed independently without any more in american influence in a different cultural milieu it's like mm -hmm. the the bean the bean traveling from north america to india and now has a variety of other subspecies and food culture associated with kidney beans in india although mm -hmm. the kidney beans came from america or mm -hmm. chili for that matter and i'm making an agricultural example because it's it's most relevant yeah. although the chili came from america but indian cuisine is nothing without chilies mm -hmm. if you think about it similarly Although the New Deal programs ended with the end of uh, FDR and you know that 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 era of American politics and 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 society, mm -hmm. these programs still have continued to manifest and even grow into their own in countries like India. The MSP program is one such program, but this MSP program, which is the minimum support price program, is nothing without other guarantees uh, in the system, like a grain reserve where farmers can actually sell their grain directly to the government. The, another another, another uh, limb of this system is a public food distribution system where people who cannot afford to get like, uh, you know, who, who cannot, who are not privileged enough or cannot have, do not have the means to earn and, and get that nutritious food can actually go to the government and buy subsidized grain. So there is first the minimum support program, which is procured directly from the farmers at a fair rate. Then there is a grain reserve or a body that is saving the excessive grain from the market as a national strategic food reserve. And mm -hmm. then there is a public distribution system, which is the third limb, which is offering, which is giving out this, this particular grains or particular uh, agri commodities that, it's, that it has uh, procured from the farmers in a fair way. Keep in mind, fair, fair is the most important word here, that mm -hmm. the farmers are given the fair price. They are stored using the fair price and, the, and public, public infrastructure. And then they are given to the lowest strata of society who need that. So it's fairness at three places, mm -hmm. at the storage, at the price, in the growing, and also in the distribution. Mm -hmm. So that's the system that's currently active in India. Of course, there have been corporate pressures to ensure that the system does not spread beyond certain regions of the country. Mm -hmm. You know, we are not perfect. India is not perfect. We have many problems. One of our problems is also bribery. One of our problems is corruption. One of our problems is supply mismanagement, but the biggest problem is the lack of political will due to corporate and, and simply greed. Like mm -hmm. if you sacrifice farmers, a corporation can make more money. Like we have a, and we have a belief that every step of a functioning society that you destroy has a monetary profit for somebody else. Mm -hmm. For example, if you destroy the art of conversation, you pay the mobile companies or some digital AI to make emails mm -hmm. or draft letters for you. You understand mm -hmm. what, I'm, what I'm trying to say? And I'm giving a more non-agricultural example. But as soon as you destroy your neighbor, as soon as you are hostile towards your neighbor, that's when the tractor comes in. Mm -hmm. That's when, you know, that's when the, the multi, multi router cultivator, harvester, rotor comes in. When you, when you stop talking to your wife, you stop talking with your children, that's when the family, family farm becomes a cafe. 
you have mm. you have to understand that you know that when when we are actually wanting to put everything with the machines with the industry with the market that's when society is really lost yeah and but i know i'm going off on a different tangent but we need to get back to this so so <laughs> so india has these protections and then then the indian farmer is still quite respected in the country mm-hmm. and why all this could happen is because the indian farmer and people are still connected with the land otherwise this movement would have been just a complete blood bloodshed they would have bombed mm-hmm. the farmers the bombed the farmer convoys as they were approaching delhi mm-hmm. but that does not happen because india needs its farmers more than ever today mm-hmm. 800 million people in india depend on government food rations just to survive that's how bad the state of agriculture is mm-hmm. and if you and and the irony ben here is that in india is about 115 on the hunger index of countries out of 126 countries india is 115th mm. on the hunger index so imagine a country which is hungry a country which is malnourished and yet its farmers are vilified and attacked and that the food that they are uh, food that they are producing in a hungry country is not valued yeah or rather it is valued but they don't get the value someone else is stealing that value from them mm-hmm. I don't know if I answered that question, but I tried to kind of give you another overarching perspective of how this all this fits in, Absolutely. and the American perspective. And just coming back to one last point about this American system that we are we are connected in many many ways more than we know. And mm-hmm. a, and a program like uh, you know you mentioned the tobacco tobacco program mm-hmm. that is actually a program that is a way for the future for for farmers from the developing worlds, farmers from the global south. I'm mm-hmm. not going to talk about the wheat or the corn program. but the subsistence nature of the tobacco program when it began mm-hmm. and i'm again you know i'm repeating this is not about i'm not a pro tobacco person but i'm a pro tobacco program person mm-hmm. because the model that the tobacco program gave us is exactly what the indian farmers are fighting for the indian farmers have one principal demand which is to have a tobacco program like system installed in india and made into a legal right legal guarantee that every farmer who grows any morsel of grain or any kernel of grain will get that minimum price floor if that person manages to get that to the market yard mm-hmm. yeah uh, that's uh, couldn't have said it better myself uh <laughs> the uh the, we we certainly believe in it here we know that there's a lot of um maybe history isn't quite the isn't quite the word but a lot of There are a lot of things tied up in a program like this. There's a lot of culture tied up in a program like this. And what we've seen here since, you know, more or less the collapse of the program in the very early 2000s is I mean exactly what you're describing, you know, the 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 ties that bind a community together that come out of a shared work, that come out of a well-resourced farmstead uh people who can afford to farm well and you mentioned subsistence i mean the the beauty of the tobacco program is that it didn't incentivize um in its ori- in its original conception it didn't incentivize a small holding farmer to pull up all his fences and plow you know from one end of from the uh from the creek to the road uh and capitalize on this because what it did is it took farmers out of competition with one another and it allowed a style of farming wherein certainly your cash crop your tobacco was a very important part of the year but you could build a diverse uh sustainable kind of naturally uh oriented kind of farming around that tobacco crop um and that kind of brings us back to like the difference in scale between indian agriculture and american agriculture i think here in this country when a lot of people think about the family farm what they are thinking about more closely resembles the average indian farmstead than the average american farmstead i mean these days the the average american farm uh you know, we're talking 4 or 500 acres you know we're talking about an industrial operation you know more or less a corn factory uh that that happens on the land a soybean factory that happens on these giant farmscapes with fewer and fewer people involved in that cultivation and therefore fewer and fewer people involved in the culture of those places as well holding those places together and that's what we've seen all over this country you know the the kind of diminution and and dissolution of farm towns you know what we would traditionally consider a, a farming community 
Um, we happen to hold on to it longer than most people here in Kentucky, uh, again, in large part, thanks to the tobacco cooperative, but um, we're losing people faster than anywhere else in the country too, because of that, you know, we have the most to lose right now. So it's, uh, it's both encouraging to hear, you know, uh, from another country's perspective, like this is what we want. It's also discouraging to hear that you're suffering the same sorts of things that we are. Um, and I think I think that's a real uh, a connection that people here, um, I think, could make really easily if they have a, a farming background. I think they would understand um, these kind of cultural ties that you're describing, these kind of community ties that you're describing a lot better than, uh, you know, an urban dweller in maybe even in Delhi could. Uh, it, it's possible. Um, I would like to maybe if we could sort of wrap up thinking about some of the other implications of kind of farm action like this. You told me right before we, we jumped on this call, uh, something like 65 countries on the globe here uh, have reported farm, -cent I'll say farm centric protests, you know, either farmer led or on behalf maybe of farmers. Um, we see it a lot in the news from Western Europe uh, in particular since the, um, uh, Russian invasion, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, that's kind of thrown the cat among the pigeons with the international kind of grain market. But I wonder if you could talk maybe about some of these other farm protests, uh, what you've seen that they've been kind of centered around. And uh, maybe also just uh, wrap up with like the, a lot of these seem to be a, a consequence of the global nature of agricultural trade. Um, you talked about protectionism before. Um, I, I, uh, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a protectionist necessarily, but I think agriculturally we've seen over and over again that the, the globalization of trade has, has just been disastrous for, for what we would call small and mid-scale farmers here. Um, maybe you could talk to, speak to that a little bit, these uh, protests elsewhere in the world, what they have in common with the Indian farm protests, what, what, are, what are some differences and then maybe the kind of nature of the global economy in these, the influence of the global economy in these. Sure. So I think I'm going to rewind back to the American agriculture movement, sure, which sure. was the 1980s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's because that the story begins actually there. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind of tactics that were used by American farmers in the tractor cades to DC, tractor cades to mm -hmm. Des Moines and, and other and other state capitals, mm -hmm. you know, that was the first breaking point of of how can farmers protest using modern agricultural equipment mm -hmm. keep that in mind it's it's a very very important distinction that's going to come later okay yeah so keep the history of the american agriculture movement in mind and everything that they did and everything that they could not do and, and everything and 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 the reasons why they fell farmers across the world were watching it very very carefully even more carefully than you can imagine mm -hmm. now being after the dunkel draft after the GATT happened you know there was an energy of agro-political resistance, which is which had started to actually grow in parts of the world, especially in the global south. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you you push back to the Indian farmers movement, which is in 19, uh, 2020. Now all the tactics that were used in terms of the optics, you will find that the American agriculture movement and the Indian movement used similar similar display tactics, mm -hmm. civil disobedience, tractor cades. Of course, it had an Indian flavor, but I'm just trying to show you the connection, the intercultural connections of agro-political resistance movements in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. And from, from the AAM, we moved to the Indian movement, which managed to do this Occupy style, you know, occupied Delhi's main roads, blockaded the city for 13 months. So it is a hybrid form of, of protesting, which is now developing in the world. And I'm and my one of my particular new areas of study is this agro-political resistance that started to emerge in a big way in 2023. If you look at the year 2023, we find that 65 countries, and it's not just European countries, it's Nigeria, it's like countries in Africa, Latin America, in fact, places in Mexico also, like farmers are not happy. And what do these 65 protests tell us? It tells us one simple message that industrial agriculture is failing the paradigm of industrial agriculture, which is driven by greed, which is driven by artificial farm and market based, which is which is driven by market market based economy and market based greed, is not working for the farmers. Mm -hmm. The other backside is that you know they they assured us that this is going to give us higher yields. This is going to give us prosperity. You know that dream has come crashing. 
and it's not just for the indian farmers it's not just for the african farmers it's for the french farmers it's for the dutch farmers it's for the irish farmers it's for the american farmers yeah everyone knows this is for the canadian farmers everyone knows this that now the water has come up to right here you know the water is right here <laughs> and if we don't do anything we're going to drown in it mm-hmm. and and just look at the signaling now i'm going to just jump into the european protests for a little bit because they are most popular and in fact some of your readers may or listeners would have also seen them they are spraying they are doing this the recent one being germany mm-hmm. but german farmers actually followed exactly the mo of the indian farmers mm-hmm. they blockaded the cities they had their tractor marches they were non violent they mm-hmm. did not do the spraying as the french ones did they just came protested in a gandhian way in a non violent very jesus kind of way that well we are here <laughs> to prove a point and we're going to do this with love we mm-hmm. don't want this violence anywhere okay but look what the government did to them mm-hmm. look at what the government of france did to these people you know there were spanish farmers also who were protesting mm-hmm. so all over the place people were saying we do not want these globalist agendas we do not want this and i know some people think that all this is too right wing some people think it's too much of like conspiracy theory but it's actually in your face cuz 65 countries have reported farm protests mm-hmm. because of the state of agriculture which is actually the same state of agriculture it's one design that's being pushed on these farmers and different farming countries are in different stages of that process mm-hmm. european farmers and american pro- farmers are probably the pioneers and the vanguard of the industrial agriculture system and the international trade system yeah. whereas where you are in the global south defines what level are you at but the you know this unison this protest which has happened across various stages across various geographies across various kind of milieus cultural milieus and people signal mm-hmm. one lesson that industrial agriculture and the global agrarian trade system is now falling flat on its face now mm-hmm. you come to the global uh, trade system see no one is against trade everyone wants a fair trade because i need something from you ben you need something from me and mm-hmm. that's how cooperation happens you know i yeah. love my uh, for example american cheese or american milk and you like my indian spices and we should mm-hmm. trade so that we can we can both get what we want right <laughs> and there's no wrong in trading but i think the evil happens the you know and i and i use evil very carefully here i'm not sure. using it loosely it's mm-hmm. because of the large concentration of 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 the global agrarian system by a few players a few players a handful of them control mm-hmm. the world's grain a handful of them control the world's shipping a handful of them com- control the world's retail and a handful of hedge funds control all of the above <laughs> okay so mm-hmm. when we talk of problems of global trade we are talking about how they are the, the our oppressors are the same it doesn't matter if i am indian and you are american our oppressors the people who want to take our kernel from our soil people who want to rob us of our dignity are the same in today's world that's what extreme globalization that's what extreme uh, concentration of wealth has done it has created the master overlords of the world and they control the world by exploiting her farmers and taking control of their grain now that is a big piece and they want to keep farmers pitch pitched against each other mm-hmm. they want to tell the european farmers well you know what those indian farmers have no standards and that's why they are beating you in the money mm-hmm. and they are not telling you that the kind of pesticides and other things that they are making us spray on our on our crops to make it even slightly cheaper mm-hmm. are actually more toxic for our environment and the and the real costs of doing of growing that cheaper is is much more expensive mm-hmm. no one tells you this but there is more dumping from the from the western world onto developing countries for commodities like corn wheat and and i'm sure you know the story better than i like uh, america was dumping corn in the in the sea mm-hmm. so that the prices of corn don't fall in the world mm-hmm. so when you are when people are going hungry today it's believed that 90% of if if america just saves all of its food waste the world yeah. can be fed twice <laughs> so it's not a problem of trade i think it's a problem of evil it's a problem of it's a problem of how the concentration of this trade uh, with with a few players mm-hmm. has has been detrimental to farmers all over and this and we need to come together if our oppressors have come together i mm-hmm. think it's about time that movements and agrarian movements of the world have to come together conversations like this you mm-hmm. know understanding that why we share the same beating heart and the same soul and the same love for the land that mm-hmm. needs to be actually put out more these conversations need to be talked about more so that the farmers have a solidarity and we're not pitching farmers against farmers that's the worst thing we can do in this world right now Absolutely. so that the 
because the corporations are just wanting that they want us to divide so that they can rule mm -hmm. well i agree completely and i think again the reason um the reason my personally my eye was drawn to the the indian farm protests is just how legible it was to me how recognizable it was having seen you know some of these things that you mentioned um this the kind of wave of um, usda protests in the 70s and 80s uh in particular around the plight of um uh you know southern black farmers who were you know more or less a bellwether for the rest of us they were driven out of the market earlier than a lot of their you know uh white colleagues but it's not a it was just a difference in when it happened. It wasn't a difference in what happened. You know what I mean? Um, it, it It's more or less coming for all of us. The, the forces of the market are, uh, you know, you're protected from them in some ways if you are a massive landholder, if you're farming 2,000 acres. In some ways, you're more susceptible to them. Um, and I think that shouldn't be overlooked either. But uh, regardless, like you say, having a good understanding of what's going on elsewhere in the world, seeing the uh, comparable nature of the struggle um, in different places and just having a better understanding of, of the, the people who are engaged in the care and love of the land, just like our folks are here, um, seeing that all over the world. I think there, there's nothing more important. Um, uh, I, th I think that's as good a place to leave it as any. Um, is there any, uh, maybe, maybe a last word from you? Uh, what's next? What's, uh, where where's the hope where is the what can we look forwards to um in this kind of time of great uh seemingly we're on the cusp of some sort of great change one way or the other what uh, you've mentioned hopeful things like being in conversation with one another understanding the struggle of people you know halfway across the world who are engaged in the same work that you are um what else what what's next See, Ben, I'll tell you, and I'll leave, with a, I'll leave you with a good reality. We mm -hmm. do not know what's going to happen with the farmers' movement as it is right now. Sure. But I will tell you that the farmers are not going to go back home alive. Either mm -hmm. they will get to what they want to, or they will go back dead. Mm -hmm. This is a really a make-or-break moment, not just for Indian agriculture, but for democracy in the world. Mm -hmm. If 25 million people cannot assert themselves in a peaceful way and tell their government that we do not want corporate exploitation, Mm -hmm. and this is unsuccessful, then the world has no hope. I'll mm -hmm. tell you that much. If, 20, if the will of 25 million people can be suppressed just mm -hmm. for corporate gain, we are already in Babylon. Mm -hmm. and, and the end of times is near. And mm -hmm. it has a huge, like, far-reaching repercussions for each and every individual. Mm -hmm. Whether you believe in energies, you believe in vibrations, you believe in justice, you believe in international law of order and other such words. If the will of 25 million people who are fighting nonviolently is suppressed, doomsday is next. Hmm. And I just want to, again, reiterate the point that we think that the, that the sword is not coming for us. While we wield the sword, we think that the sword won't kill us. Mm -hmm. But in the end, those who live by the sword perish by it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether you're black, white, yellow, whatever the categories and distinctions of this world are. In front of huge, massive, monstrous, uh, like uh, monstrous, uh, like this, this massive greed. They will eat you all. They are mm -hmm. not there for your, for your families, for your loved ones. They are there for their money, which they will take. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind that when you let your neighbor die and suffer injustice, it's only it will only be five minutes later that you will suffer the same injustice yourself. And we must fight for it. That's what Jesus fought for. That's for anybody with a heart fought for, and we should continue the fight. The Indian farmers have retold us and made me at least see the revolution of my times. In my lifetime, I don't think so I will see another revolution. Mm -hmm. But this was it. That's going to set me on to tell the tales of love and unconditional kindness, even in the face of deep, deep danger. This is what the Indian farmers movement has taught me and mm -hmm. the world. And I hope they live on, and I hope other farmers of the world rise up in peacefully, rise up in love, so that the rights of all of us can be protected. Mm. Well, that at least is something very inspiring to uh, to close on. Um, Indra Shekhar Singh, thank you so much for joining us today. 
Um, folks at home, if you're interested in more of what Indra has to say, uh, he writes a really excellent column at The Wire. Uh, you can find it, search The Wire, India, Indra Shekhar Singh. You'll see the, uh, the spelling of his name down there below. Uh, the podcast is great. And it's a really, uh, your writing, I think, is a really interesting view, um, again, at an agricultural system, at an economy, and at a culture that is uh, in some ways very different from ours, in some ways so, so familiar. Um, and I just want to thank you again for joining us today. And I hope we see you very, very soon. Well, thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And this has been a most excellent conversation. Thanks. Right, thank you much. And thank you to you at home for watching. Um, if you're interested in what we do here at the Barry Center, uh, as always, you can find us at barrycenter.org. Um, find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Thank you all again for joining us. Uh, and we'll see you next time.